Though the truth may vary, this ship will carry our body safe to shore. Are we okay with the video? We want to try it again? No, we're not. Good afternoon. Good to see you here. I hope you're enjoying the weather. Slight southwest breeze, kind of mysterious sky, uh, and, and drizzling kind of happiness. Drizzling happiness. That's kind of the situation that we have. And and it's similar to kind of if you're enjoying the conference, is that if you're not. It's your blame, you to blame. It's a, it's an atmosphere. It's an intent, and and, and that's why it's important to find uh, the enjoyment in things that uh, uh, you you wanna be part of. Uh, we wanted to do uh, uh, this session uh, uh, because we're coming to the end of the conference. It's not the end. It might just be the. Uh, end of the beginning because what we want to do is is we want to create a movement and that was one of the things that we kind of hoped uh, in this conference that uh, we would give you a really good network we would give you some experiences and that uh, uh, you would gain experience but also we wanted to kind of in in all your work that you will be part of a new movement and and, and we ourselves wanted to be a part of a new movement and that's around this theme. So theme of research in action, uh, uh, we want to create a movement around that. We want to create a platform uh, where practitioners come together and academics and, and talk about this issue. We've had uh, uh, some really, really good uh, uh, discussion about this and we hope we can continue that. So we will be sending out a message, a call for those who uh, want to embrace this theme and be a part of that. And, and hopefully we can have a, a, a biannual conference here in Reykjavik around that theme with the support of URAM. Uh, because I think it's important that it's not just once a year we have a URAM conference, but we have smaller conferences around interesting themes. And those themes that we have developed as URAM and, and kind of have had a, a, a really good discussions about. So, uh, uh, what I also wanted to do here today is have a session uh, uh, that was not a panel, uh, giving our experience with panel maybe. Uh, uh, I wanted to have a, a, a really interesting uh, discussion uh, uh, and, and I wanted a kind of someone who could carry that. And, and for that, uh, uh, to carry something like that, uh, it needs to be a remarkable person. Uh, and believe me, uh, uh, the, the speaker today is a remarkable person. Uh, he did his doctorate in, in 1965. Uh, he was the pro first professor here at the University around political science in 1973. And he is, even though he went into uh, politics and uh, into parliament after that, he's always been very, very positive and supportive about the University of Iceland. And uh, if you could have seen the message of the video, uh, there was a message from the president. And, and, and the reason was he was the first person I could think of who would support an initiative like this, where we would get a conference like URAM to Iceland. So, so that was uh, 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 very important. And uh, uh, he became a president in, in, in 1996 and uh, stayed as president for 20 years until uh, 90, uh, 2016 and is the longest serving president in Iceland and at the time uh, he was one of the longest serving heads uh, of states in the world and I know Sibyl you will think of dictatorship when you hear numbers like that but it's far from that he's been opposite on that he's been really trying to serve uh, Icelanders and all those uh, different kind of uh, uh, things that we've been trying to do uh, and in a, in a period of, of a, a kind of 
a roller coaster of an economic cycle, just to say mildly. So, so it's been very supportive, and I remember uh, 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 that uh, he's he's been supporting initiatives that have gained a, a lot of attention uh, in the last years. So even after the presidency, he's been active internationally and, and, and been a key person uh, about discussion about this new kind of phenomenon, or, or maybe not a new, but differences in the Arctic Circle and how that changes the whole uh, global landscape. Um, uh, I think it's uh, also important to know that, of course, as head of state, uh, uh, you meet uh, all the world leaders and a lot of very important people. And some 15 years ago, uh, he met me. <laughs> and uh, uh, the reason was we were really excited about creating an ecosystem around entrepreneurship. And, and we were trying to figure out ways to do that. And there was this initiative uh, uh, about creating some uh, uh, conferences about venture capitalism. And even though we didn't have much experience and, and much kind of uh, international support at that time, all, uh, 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 our speaker kind of uh, supported this very, very heartfully and, and even went not just to Iceland with us, but, but uh, to New York to promote this. And, and just last week, we had uh, the 15th anniversary of this program, which is run in, in, in somewhat 40 countries where we train entrepreneurs, hundreds of entrepreneurs every year to kind of negotiate and have a dialogue with, with uh, investors. So, so it's been a, 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 just this small initiative in starting it, giving us the credibility, helped us a lot. So when I was thinking about maybe, maybe it would be really, really interesting if we can have a movement about, around research in action, I couldn't think of anyone except this person to kind of uh, give us the boost needed to, to, to make that into action. So, ladies and gentlemen, please stand up and give a hand to the doctor, to the professor, to the president, Olavur Ragnar Grimson. Well, thank you very much. Uh for the somewhat uh, exaggerated uh, introduction. <laughs> uh, I have to say I've been introduced in many meetings, uh, also in this hall here. Well, this is the first time I've been introduced uh, by a man in a football shirt. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, uh, that uh, created some of the, uh, the spirit of the introduction. But uh, the follow-up to such an introduction would, of course, be Iceland winning the next match against, uh, against Nigeria. But I have to say, it's quite remarkable to have uh, you here on this, uh, I would say, this hour of approaching the, uh, the next game of Iceland in the World Championship of Football. When I drove through the city to come here, uh, I was delayed because uh, the street was becoming full of people. Who would, despite the weather, actually see it's a rather good weather. I mean, don't apologize for it. I mean, who would uh, not prefer to be here in Iceland in 10 degrees and a little bit of rain than in uh, 40 degrees uh, I mean, somewhere else? <laughs> so we will have to try to park this discussion into the time uh, remaining until the kickoff, assuming. Some of you want to watch this historic match. It is, in fact, quite remarkable that uh, you have a nation of 300,000 people uh, uh, playing the World Championship. And I'm often asked the question, why? How is it? And many people think uh, it's some kind of a miracle, but it's not. 
It is an end result or a result of a 20-year process which uh, systematically built up the facilities, the infrastructure, the education and the training that led us to Russia and also led us to this fantastic moment of kicking England out of the European Championship <laughs> last year. For those of us who had to fight England in the financial crisis, it was a, uh, it was a, a, a very nice kind of victory. And I mention that here today not just because we are meeting on the hour leading up to the second match, but also because it is perhaps the key to what I have been asked to talk to you about here today which is the transformation, the global transformation, which is taking place very rapidly from what has been uh, the dominant factor in not just the economies of the world, but in most economic and managerial discussions for the last 50 and 20 years, that the world is driven by a, a fossil fuel dependent economy where the oil rich states and the, the rich energy companies provide the driving force of those countries that control those resources are the dominant players on the world stage. And the notion that somehow we can have a different economy, a sustainable economy, green economy, clean energy economy, whatever we call it, was even at the beginning of the century a very strange notion. Yes, some people said we have to do it in order to save the planet, and there were visionaries who, because of their environmental campaigns, advocated it, but it was not treated as a realistic view of how business would develop or how countries would prosper. It was a kind of a niche view of the world, even in the beginning of the 21st century. It had been so for more than a hundred years. And we have seen uh, not only countries rise to power and empires and even wars being fought in order to maintain this fundamental structure in the global economy. And countries like Venezuela, Russia, the United States, Saudi Arabia, even Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates and others became dominant global players, whether they were large or small, simply because of the access to this economy. And the biggest companies of the world were thought to be those who were surely and squarely based in this economic reality of the last hundred years. And those who were saying the world's need to shift were either created as as idealistic visionaries, or crackpots, or completely unrealistic. They were of course allowed in some of the international conferences because people wanted to be enlightened, but basically they were not a part of the serious discussion. And we all know that. But what has happened in the last 10 or 15 years is an extraordinary shift which in my opinion is now producing and will do even more so in the next 10 or 15 years, a fundamental transformation of both the global economy and the economies of respective states. Seeing new players emerge on the global scene and dominant global companies basing their performance on a completely new approach to sustainability, to green economy and clean energy. And in this respect, of course, Iceland is a fascinating example of how this transformation not only helps a country to get out of a very deep and profound financial crisis, but also gives it an extraordinary strategic position, despite its smallness, for cooperation with various global players, and indeed, as I will explain towards the end, has led our team to Russia to play later on, and having had this historic role of kicking Argentina out of the World Cup. <laughs> so what's the evidence 
for this transformation. Let's start with Google. Google is, as everybody knows, one of the largest, most influential companies in the world. It has now been for over 10 years a fundamental part of their business model that they don't build data centers, they don't build new facilities, unless it's based on very strict principles of sustainability and clean energy. Let's look at Microsoft which decided to choose Denmark as a base for its new data center in Europe because of the wind energy provided in Denmark and the cable from Norway providing hydropower into the data center when uh, the Danish wind power was not providing sufficient, sufficient energy. Let's look at Walmart, the biggest retail company in the world, which now also for over a decade has had a rigorous policy of uh, their shops, their facilities, having to be based on clear sustainability principle and clean energy and green, green economy principle. We can take one leading company in the world after another. Even the United Arab Emirates have now an aggressive program of moving away from oil over to sun power and other clean energy resources for their country. And as the Crown Prince said two years ago, we will celebrate, that is a direct quote, we will celebrate the last barrel of oil. And you go into the deserts and you see these mega sun power stations of 100 megawatts, 300 megawatts, one after another, which they have built in the last five years. Even Saudi Arabia has now formulated a plan for the next 20 years which is based on the principle that if they don't move aggressively over to a new foundation for the domestic energy economy, away from oil over to clean energy, they will have to become net importers of, 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 clean en of energy by the middle of this century. And why is it? One of the reasons is, for example, in Abu Dhabi, 40% of the energy production of Abu Dhabi is for cooling buildings. The cities of the world are not livable unless you change the premise of the sustainability and the energy base on these cities. And that is a world where by the middle of the century two-thirds of the population will live in cities. Even President Xi Jinping decided a year ago that he would build a new mega city close to Beijing, in the Hubei area, of 80 million people, 80 million people, based on strict sustainability principles that it would be the largest sustainable city in the world. And this morning, the leadership of the Chinese Academy of Urban Planning and Design left Iceland because they have been here on a fact-finding mission to study how this city Reykjavik was transformed from being utterly dependent on coal and oil, as it was during the first decades of my life, into being one of the most primary examples of a clean energy sustainable city, despite the critics that we can criticize, we can put forward of what it is today, with not only clean air and no pollution, but the swimming pools, sport facilities, greenhouse agriculture, and all the other parts. But there is also another factor which is two other factors which are driving this transformation. One is that the new, younger, professional and educated population in, in Asia, in America, these people who come out of universities and have enjoyed the benefits of access to information through the internet transformation, they are making completely new demands of the kind of food they want to buy in the shops what kind of cities they want to live in, and what kind of future they want to have for themselves and their children. And this educated young class in Asia, America and Europe, the new customers of global companies, both now and especially in the next few decades, are making it absolutely necessary for companies that want to stay in the market to adjust 
their management and the product and the whole approach to these new demands. And then, of course, we have the climate crisis. We have the outcome of the Paris summit where some of the major business leaders of the world came together and were partners to the conclusion that unless we have a major shift to prevent the world from changing the climate, uh, we will suffer disaster. That is why one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the last 40 years, Michael Bloomberg, and nobody can doubt that Michael Bloomberg knows how to build a company. Nobody can doubt how he can build it. He came from nothing and built Bloomberg up to a major global player and made himself one of the 20 richest people in the world. He is now devoting most of his time to chairing the global alliance of mayors in order to build sustainable and green cities. There are thousands of mayors, the elected heads of cities all over the world, who have now come together and realized that it is both a business necessity and a political necessity to transform the cities and do it in cooperation with the business community. IRENA, which is this international organization established a part of the United Nations framework a little over a decade ago with now over 160 countries and members, decided earlier this year to set up an international commission, the first time it's being done, to deliver a report in January at the Assembly of IRENA in Abu Dhabi of the geopolitical transformation from an oil-driven economy over to a renewable energy-based global economy. And I was somehow convinced to chair this commission, and it's not been a fascinating experience through the international expertise and the corporate leaders of some of the major global companies that we have entered into dialogue with in order to prepare this report. And as all of you know who are familiar with discussions about international politics, the geopolitical importance of oil has been some of the most dominant factors of that whole analysis. And therefore to set up a commission supported by 160 states to map out the transformation over to renewable energy is not just of political importance, it's an economic signal to every company in the world about where the changes are going. And in this respect, of course, Iceland is, in many ways, an ideal location to, uh, first of all, present this analysis, but secondly, also to draw conclusions and be inspired by it. We were, even up to the first decades of my life, literally the poorest country in Europe a nation of farmers and fishermen with hardly any infrastructure in the country. In the beginning of the 20th century, there was no harbour in Iceland. But there was no road system. A country the size of England. And we were then a nation of 100,000 people. And imagine the task for 100,000 people to build the entire infrastructure in a landmass the size of England. The schools, the hospitals, the airports, the harbours, the roads, the sport facilities, the, and everything else. And then to move away from imported energy over to clean energy and begin by inviting in the 1960s a Swiss aluminum company to set up an aluminum smelter in Iceland based on the access to the clean energy. And then as we have evolved building complicated other industrial products and data storage centers and leading, in fact, to the very remarkable decision that when Lehman Brothers collapsed, Rio Tinto, one of the biggest companies in the world, which at that time owned the aluminum smelter here, you see on the way from the airport, decided to terminate all their global investments completely. They would not invest anywhere for an undefined time. The first investment decision that Rio Tinto took two years after the fall of Lehman Brothers, was to modernize the aluminum smelter in Iceland for a half a billion US dollars. 
At that time, Iceland was still treated by our European friends as a failed financial state. But because of the sustainable economy, Rio Tinto, which, as you all know, has invested in over 100 countries in the world and does not do investments as charity, decided that the long-term bet on a sustainable, clean, green economy served the interest of the company. And if you ask Google or Microsoft or Whole, or Whole Food or, or, or many other companies, whether they're in America or Europe, or even now in Asia, why they are doing this shift, they will all tell you they do it because of the market position. Not as a charity or a visionary act in order to save the climate. It's a, a necessary part to provide a healthy balance sheet in the coming years and decades. They do it because it's good business, not because it's an environmental ideology. And this is the big shift. That this is now taking place because it is good business. It's the profit motive that is driving this. Now, the improvement in some technology may have made some power cheaper than oil. That's the market fact. It's not cheaper to let companies be driven by sun power than to buy oil. Wind power is cheaper than oil. Geothermal, of course, I mean, there's no comparison. And so on. So the transformation is now made not just because, in terms of cost analysis, it's cheaper, but also the growing army of enlightened consumers out there in the global market are examining what is the sustainability and the carbon footprint of their respective companies. So here in Iceland, we have moved away from oil and coal in the last 40 years. And the end result is that we have not only saved enormous amount of money in terms of our own domestic energy consumption, but we are now building urban heating systems all over the world. We are now partnering up with China and Sinopec the biggest energy company in the world, in building clean energy urban heating systems in 80 places in China. It's the biggest geothermal company and project in the world. And we are doing it also in Europe, other parts of Asia and elsewhere. And the Asian Development Bank quite recently gave 250 million US dollars loan in order to expand this model to other countries in Asia. We have drawn not just aluminum smelters to different parts of Iceland, but also built up a, an extraordinary uh, dynamic with a great potential data storage sector. Although you might have various views of uh, the Bitcoin phenomena in modern business, what I have to either celebrate or justify or, or, or take the criticism for when I meet people now in different parts of the world that Iceland is a key player uh, in the Bitcoin throughout data centers. And although you complain about the rain, the combination of clean energy and a very little gap in the average temperature means that data storage centers are more competitive in Iceland than in any other part of the world. But we've also use this transformation to develop an extraordinary successful tourism sector. You're all familiar with the Blue Lagoon. Now we receive there every year one million people. One million people. Each of them pay at the minimum 40 euros to bath themselves in a spill of water from a geothermal power plant. And they all live happy, and there's a long queue and a waiting list in order to do it. You can visit Friedheimer, it's a family agricultural greenhouse tomato producing farm in the southern part of Iceland, owned by a husband and a wife, run by them and their kids. They receive 150,000 tourists a year who want to see how tomatoes are grown in an environmentally successful way. They now earn more from tourists coming to watch this phenomenon and from the sales of the tomatoes. 
that they produce them. We have a geothermal power plant here in Hedgeshead, which takes in over 100,000 tourists a year who simply want to see what the clean energy power plant looks like. We can list these phenomena all around the country and without the emphasis of sustainability and the green economy, we would not have this tourism boom. Because people, for example, from Asia, they have never had a one-day experience in a pollution-free city. They have never been able to eat vegetables or fish, being assured that it's not an environmental hazard. Even my wife and two of our British friends uh, were in February two years ago uh, taking our friends from England to this traditional Golden Circle, Think with there and Good for and Geyser. And as we had our lunch in the Geyser area, it was full of people, mostly from Asia. And there were five young pro women sitting at the table next to us, clearly from Asia, and we said to her, what in hell are they doing here in February? I mean, it was snowing, it was cold, or really the weather here is like paradise compared to what it was then. Why are these people, women from Asia, here in February? So my wife, who always wants to find out things, stood up, went to the table, introduced herself, and asked them the question. It turned out they were all from the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So their dream destination in February is, is Iceland. And if people, young professional women who work on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, see it as the ideal solution for their holiday is to travel all the way up to Iceland. Something fundamentally is happening, I can tell you. <laughs> if you need the proof that the world is chasing, that's it. <laughs> that's it. And then let's take the fishing sector. How we have transformed what was a traditional fish, fishing into the leading fishing industry in terms of utilizing in a maximum sustainable way the ocean resources. And then I'm leaving aside the disputes in Iceland over the quota system and how much they pay. I'm just talking about the whole process of approaching ocean resources in the way of maximum utilization and then building up high-tech companies like Mara and Skyen or IT companies to trace the boats on the ship. Even a few weeks ago, Trachwell, the Icelandic company, made the team with Kiribati, which is a small island state in the Pacific, and Australia to monitor their entire fishing zone based on Icelandic IT technology. And we have, in addition to the fishing company, uh, an extraordinary collection of IT companies, biotech companies, and others that have grown up in association with this sector. We have companies like, like Peresis, for example, which takes the skin of the fish and produces a kind of a band-aid which you put on incurable human wounds. And the cells from the fish skin grow into the human body and the wound is cured. And we have now made, or they have made, an agreement with the American Food and Drug Administration and the American Armed Forces to use this product. But the fundamental basis of why the American Food and Drug Administration accepted it into the American market was the relative purity of the North Atlantic Ocean. And they said very clearly, if this had been a fish skin from the Mediterranean, we would never have approved it. So we are seeing a, a great gathering of cutting-edge companies in information technology and biotechnology using the sustainable ocean plus the advance of research and entrepreneurial action in this uh, field to build up fast-growing world-class companies in many different areas. And then you have the uh, greenhouse agricultural sector which has transformed the local greenhouse agriculture in a fundamental way and has enabled us to uh, not only feed the uh, two million tourists who come to Iceland in this way, but also build up interesting sites for people to look at. I could stand here long after the football match is finished and continue to give you entrepreneurial examples of business success based on this model. And that is why 
many people now from different parts of the world, they come to Iceland like the leaders of the China Urban Planning and Design uh, Institution were here this week to understand this transformation of the world and to see for themselves that it is indeed a good business. You know, we have one of the highest living standards in Europe, 10 years after the financial crisis. We live longer than any other nation in Europe. We have a lower death rate of children. Despite our own criticism of our health system, we cure heart diseases and cancer better than most other countries in Europe, not to speak of countries in Asia, Africa and other parts of the world. The recognition in terms of international measurement in almost every category means that this nation, which was literally the poorest nation in Europe in the first decades of my life, is now in the top five or ten <coughs> places on almost every scale of measurement. It's in fact a too good story. And when I emphasize this here in Iceland, I always get the criticism we shouldn't talk about it in this way. We should talk about what's wrong with our system, what we're doing badly. But then my fate has been both as president and also after I left office to primarily talk to foreigners, to presidents and prime ministers and ministers from all over the world. I have had more le meetings with Chinese presidents in the last 20 years than probably any other Western leader, starting with Jiang Zemin when he came to Iceland in 2002. I have had all kinds of meetings with some of the leading figures in the American economy, whether they are people like Steve Schwarzman or Leon Black or, or David Rubenstein or, or Michael Bloomberg, who runs some of the biggest investment com companies, not just in the US, but in the entire world, or whether they are leaders of Google or, or Microsoft or many of the other companies. Same in Europe. I mean, my problem is in these discussions that these people are increasingly seeing Iceland as the proof that this global transformation is indeed good business. Because our prosperity, which nobody can doubt, exists despite our criticism. Now, of course, there are people in Iceland who could do better. I would be the first person to acknowledge that. But on the whole, giving the international measurement, there's no doubt about it where we stand. It is because we combined the sustainable use of our natural resources with a free market economy and entrepreneurship and an opportunity for education for every Icelander, wherever they wanted to seek that education in the world. It's a combination of research, science, education, and new clever use of natural resources. And as Norman Foster, the world-famous architect who has de designed some of the landmark buildings of the world, whether they are the airport in Beijing or famous office buildings in London, said when he came to visit Iceland in January a few years ago, it's very interesting because I didn't try to influence him, but when he left he said, and this is a man who will be looking at cities all over the world and designed some of the landmark buildings of the 20th, 20th century and the 21st century and built one of the most successful ar architectural companies in the world. And when he left, he said, well, it's, it's been a strange visit because somehow I feel as if I have visited the country of the future. I'd never heard that before. But since then, I've thought a lot about it. And somehow giving his knowledge and framework and his thinking that partly has made him this world-class architect, he put it all together into this kind of conclusion. And that is why I agree with you. I think Iceland is an ideal location to have a regular gathering of people interested in management, running companies, building companies, having a success in the global and the national marketplaces and bring them all together, and not only for a discussion that takes place inside our buildings, but also just for them to get the spirit of Iceland, to see it for themselves and experience it. In the same way as we have done with respect to the Arctic, having now every year 
in Iceland in October, the largest international gathering annually taking place anywhere in the world on the future of the Arctic with over 2,000 people from more than 60 countries, all of the major economies coming, coming together. So I believe very strongly that one of the most important services we can do to the world as a small country is to provide this platform, this location, for such a dialogue. Because one of the conclusions I've drawn from my experience of decades in public life is that if you want to succeed globally, it's very important to have a location. You link the world financial discussion every year to Davos for better or for worse because of the World Economic Forum. You think of Wall Street as the center of the international financial system. You think of Geneva for arms control and, and uh, solving military conflicts. Iceland has become, for many reasons, one of these locations. And it's now up to us to open it and make it ready and willing to serve many different needs. And one of them, which I believe very strongly and tried to argue here in my lecture here today, is this fundamental transformation from an unsustainable, oil-driven, carbon-based economy over to a new type of global economy where sustainability, the clean, green economy, and renewable energy are the fundamental driving factors. Thank you. Perfect. We're going to have a, a, a short dialogue, very short dialogue since then. And thank you very much for uh, uh, kind of uh, coming here in this uh, final hour before the game. So, uh, uh, you talked about this transformation uh, uh, of economies. And, and uh, uh, what's your opinion about Is everyone aware of this transformation or are there, do we still have skeptics? No, of course you still have skeptics. I mean, like the model of political empires still exists in a political dialogue around the world. You still have media companies that are basically focusing uh, on the old world. And of course there are big sections of national economies or even important companies in the global economy that have been very slow to realize this transformation. And that is why countries like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, for example, are fascinating examples of this. If you have not done it, look at the plan that Saudi Arabia has put forward. Even the Crown Prince announced uh, earlier this year that he wants to build three new mega cities in Saudi Arabia based on sustainable principles. And there's now a competition by, from many of the major global companies to be a part of that. But you see, Many of the leading global companies, uh, Google, Facebook, and many of the others, moving very aggressively in this, in this direction. And uh, in, the, uh, in the food market and the retail market, it's also absolutely clear that those companies that want to place themselves... Uh, I mean, why, why do you think that uh, the owner of Amazon sort of bought Whole Food mm. uh, a few months ago, mm. because it's a good investment. Yeah. So uh, I think what we are seeing, we are seeing the dying struggle of the old economy. Fifty years ago, most people would have said this transformation will take 60 or 70 years. Now people are saying it will take 15 to about 30 years. And I mean, uh, you come from political life, so you maybe understand this uh, far better than uh, most of us. Uh, uh, I mean, oil has defined the last hundred years. So, so, so how is this going to change kind of politics in the world? I mean, what's, what's the effect of this? Well, of course, you see, oil is only in a limited number of places. The sun, despite coming and going in terms of the weather, basically whether you're small or large, wherever you are in the world, you have access to that. Even Denmark, you look at Denmark. If anybody had predicted 30 years ago, Denmark would be an energy player, 
all of us would have loved, and the Danes would have loved loudest, because the resources were supposed to be in Norway, Iceland, and so on. Denmark had nothing, nothing, except wind, and engineers, and scientists, mm -hmm. and entrepreneurs. So they made Denmark a global player in the global energy market by creating a world-class wind energy company. And there are many examples of this kind. And if you look at the major oil players, the recent example is the decision by Start Oil to change its name. Change its name. To signal that it's no longer about oil. It's about Start Oil as a new type of energy company producing many different forms of renewable energy. So, the signals are everywhere. That is why IRENA, with the support of 160 countries and financial support from the government of Germany, the government of Norway, and the government of the United Arab Emirates, set up this international commission, which I am now chairing, which has the task to map out uh, this transformation. You asked about who are the losers, who are the winners, how will it affect the economies. Our first meeting was in Berlin about a month ago. The next meeting will start on Sunday, this Sunday in Oslo, and then the third meeting will be here in Iceland and then in, in, in Abu Dhabi. So the, I am better equipped to answer your question. I could perhaps personally answer it, but, but since I agreed to be the chairman of this commission, I think I will wait for the report to come out. Too. <laughs> <laughs> but the people in this commission are some of the uh, world leaders of global institutions and global companies uh, in, in the last 50 years. So, so one of the things that we, we thought was really interesting uh, around this conference was uh, the 19th of, of June was the Women's Rights Day. So, so no, it that? was the Women's Rights Day. I mean, uh, uh, so women got the right to vote and, and, and kind of has changed the kind of a little bit uh, uh, the landscape of, of, of economies and, and, and so forth. And, and gender equality is, is one of the key issues of our discussion here in, in, in uh, uh, Europe. So uh, I'm thinking um, uh, around this transformation and just in, in general, the, the changes in politics, uh, uh, the, the influence women have had on that. And if, if women have had uh, also influence on this uh, kind of agenda of, of this transformation that you see? But to some extent, I think it's been a separate truck. Mm. It's very difficult to analyze uh, clear interrelationship between this economic transformation and the move towards uh, gender equality. You mentioned uh, in your introduction that I had uh, been the first professor of political science at the University of Iceland and founded the social science department here at the university. And one of the things we did in the early 70s is that we did a report commissioned by the government on gender equality in Iceland, which I edited. It was the first report of this kind to be issued in Iceland. And our conclusion, criticized by many leaders of the women's movement at that time, which was over 40 years ago, was we said it would take 20 or 30 years. It's a process that would take 20 or 30 years, and women will first have to move up through the educational system, up through the local government system, and to various other different paths in the society before they can become dominant in the government or the leadership of the company. And this is exactly what has happened. Exactly what has happened. And now we are seeing, therefore, an end result of a process that takes time. And I think one of the biggest problems in talking about transformation of societies or transformation of companies or acting as a, a CEO or entrepreneur is people want immediate results. They focus on the quarterly report. And if you have not delivered within two years, you are out. It's very important to realize that fundamental change takes place, it takes time. And this whole notion of asking for instant results is a recipe for failure. <laughs> and the Icelandic football team is a very good example of this. That's why I often use it. Why are we now in Russia? Why did we kick England out and play two years ago and play a major part in stopping Argentina and Messi this year? 
The reason is that 20 years ago there were some far-sighted decisions taken by the Icelandic football and local authorities organization. One was to take the big money we got internationally from television rights and participation in the international cooperation of football and devote most of it to training young kids. Instead of training coaches for our top national team, we train coaches to teach kids at the age of 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 to play football. And now we have 700 highly qualified, fully trained coaches to do that. I mean, many countries with millions of inhabitants don't have as many trained coaches to teach kids. kids. And the other reason is we use the geothermal clean energy to build football balls where you can play football indoors every day of the year, despite the weather. And the team you're now seeing in Russia will play, start to play in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first team that has gone through this entire process since the time they were kids. And so therefore when I'm asked all over the world, why has Iceland become this phenomenon of the international football world. We even have had uh, approaches from the president of China, can we teach China to play in the, in the next, that is the question, in the next world championship. We say, no, we can't teach you that. <laughs> because nobody can teach you that, you can't do it. Mm. You have to be prepared to take a period of 10 or 15 years. And that is why I think it's fascinating to see companies like Google or Whole Foods and others, I'm using these American companies because they are world-class uh, sort of trade names. They are looking ahead 20 and 30 years. Saudi Arabia is looking ahead 20 and 30 years. China is looking ahead 30, 40, 50 years. They are now planning a city that will have 80 million people built in the next 30 years. We in Europe and the West, we are still thinking in, in quarterly or annual results. And we have to change this cultural mindset in order to be a part of this transformation. Otherwise, companies in other parts of the world will simply reap the benefit of this fundamental global transformation. But in Iceland, fortunately enough, we have realized that these different sectors are here for the long term. And our companies are willing to look ahead and invest in structures like the Blue Lagoon, very great example, has now developed from being a tiny little startup company into one of the biggest companies in Iceland with a market value of over 30 billion Icelandic crowns. They have now built a new hotel and resort next to the Blue Lagoon for highly qualified, for, for high class uh, tourists. And they have entirely financed it from the income of the company. They have not taken a single loan for that building. Because they are investing in the next 20 years, in the next 30 years. They have been brilliant enough to take the fun, formidable profit in the last 20 years of this company and invest most of it in facilities for the future. I think, I mean, one of the things that uh, I found uh, interesting uh, when kind of we were trying to kind of uh, inspire an ecosystem around entrepreneurship, uh, which is another kind of trend that we're seeing as more entrepreneurs, more, and as you talked about, uh, uh, more involvement of young people kind of taking part and creating business, not just getting educations to get a job, but actually uh, uh, finding knowledge in an uh, effort to be able to create jobs create jobs, not to take a job. And, and, and the, one of the wonderful things is uh, a couple, when we started this kind of building of things around the ecosystem is no one really understood this. And, and, and so, so we were so surprised when you, you said, I will support this. I, I, I can see that this is going to be future. And, and really interesting that you were talking about Kerisys and Trackwell. Those are companies that went through our forums. So, so we've seen kind of this uh, effect of the ecosystem being kind of very, very important for Iceland. So, so, so how do you I, see I think, this I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the problems with us here in Iceland is that we have somehow got this notion, which if you speak Icelandic, you will hear almost uh, any day and you can read on the social media and other media organization and goes through our public, public political debate. That we are very bad at running companies. Uh, everybody knows the story of the banks, and that has somehow become the ultimate proof 
that we behave almost like uh, the village folk in terms of sort of run, running companies. Whereas my view has always been, and uh, I've just, it's, a, it's an almost an academic conclusion, that it's almost a mind boggling phenomenon how such a small community has built so many world class companies in such a short time. And I have been privileged enough to follow it. I, I remember when Marel was a tiny little startup at the University of Iceland. Uh, innovating weighing skills to put on small fishing boats. It's now the leading food processing technology company in the world for fish, chicken, and beef. The largest beef producers in Latin America use marine technology. The large chicken producers in Texas use marine technology. The biggest fishing companies in many parts of Asia use marine technology. You can take Iceland there. Of course, there have been ups and downs in our airline industry. But we have built a private company because all the communication companies in Iceland, different from other European companies, have always been private companies. The shipping companies, the airline companies, uh, the, the, the trucks companies. We've never had the state running transport sectors in Iceland as it has done in France and Germany and Britain and other countries. We have been a model entrepreneurial private market country in terms of the uh, transport infrastructure. Now Iceland there flies every day out of Iceland to more destination in America than any other European airline except British, Air British Airways. There are more flights from Iceland to New York every day of the year than from any other city in Europe except London. Then we can go into the fishing sector. We can take companies like Ranti, Prim, Visi, Thorpeus, Samen. Of course, we can criticize them in terms of the quota system and uh, the price of uh, the uh, licenses for fish. But if you measure these companies against fishing companies in other countries and how that their evolution has supported an innovative uh, technological sector in both biotechnology and information technology as well as sort of the, uh, the, the, the machinery for the processing, they are world class. They are actually world class. And if you take many of the, uh, the IT companies uh, and also the new, uh, new bio, uh, biological companies, you, you see many examples of this. So my view, which is not the common view in Iceland, let me make that clear, is we are fascinating entrepreneurial phenomena in creating companies and building them up from tiny Icelandic startup companies into world-class leaders in an extraordinary short time. And I still don't really understand it, how it is done and why it is. But somehow the nation has convinced itself this is not the case. So I am in this kind of paradoxical place but on the one hand, I'm of course a part of the Icelandic discussion and was as president and so on. And then I'm part of the international discussion where there's an endless queue of visitors from all over the world wanting to come to Iceland and learn from this example. And that is why I think in terms of management of companies and entrepreneurship, Iceland is a fascinating location for an ongoing European and global dialogue because in addition to having the meetings, you can plan on-site visit to many of these companies. I often said uh, to leaders of other countries, of course, I mean, I'm a reasonably good speaker. I mean, I can put this case for Iceland uh, very eloquently, sure. But the proof of the pudding is you come to Iceland. And we take you to these sites, whether they are in the engineering sector, the IT sector, the biotechnology sector, or the, uh, or the energy or the fishing sector, and you bring your best business people or your best entrepreneurs, and we put them uh, opposite the Icelandic business people and the Icelandic entrepreneurs, and then you conclude for yourself. And that has been an inspirational experience for everybody. Last year, for example, in relation to the Arctic Circle Assembly, which I mentioned before, Emerson Collective, which Warren Jobs, Steve Jobs' widow, established a few years ago. And it's a combination of a foundation and her investment fund. And she is, as you know, the richest woman in America. 
taking over the great heritage of Steve Jobs uh, all this investment portfolio. And we organized a program for three days where her delegation met just one Icelandic IT and biotechnology and technological company after another. They were absolutely fascinated by the variety and the creativity of these companies. And one of the reasons why I supported this process that you mentioned before is that I concluded about 20 years ago, and it was not a popular conclusion at that time, that Iceland was a kind of laboratory of creation in this field. And one of the reasons why we have been successful in that sense is that even if you fail, and I leave the banks aside, I mean, talk about the others, even if you fail, there's not a negative stigma about it in Iceland. We always give you a chance to try again. We realize that entrepreneurship is a trial and error process. We understand that to build world-class companies, you make a lot of mistakes, but you try to learn from them. And I sometimes said that because of our social culture and our national characteristics, we somehow have the spirit that you can be as uh, innovative or even run risks in uh, different forms of your entrepreneurial or monetary resistance. But you always know you can come back to Iceland and have a reasonably good time with your kids or your family and enjoy the nature and the schools and the swimming pools. And, go with everybody and watch the football match on the streets so regularly, it doesn't cost anything. So society has also to be welcome to this kind of uh, economic system, for this kind of business model. And I think it has helped us that somehow we inherited the culture that has made it welcoming for people to uh, exercise their innovation and the capability in this way without the stigma and the fear of failure. And that brings us to the most important kind of uh, situation in, in the world today. How is the game going to go? <laughs> well, it's very, very difficult to say. Uh, I remember vividly in 1998, France won the World Championship of Football. And the first match they played after they were decorated by President Sirac in the LEC Palace in Paris. Two days later, they came to Iceland and played Iceland. And they didn't win. <laughs> it was an extraordinary celebration uh, 20 years ago when we played against the team that had just got the World Cup and all the medals from the president of France. And they were not able to beat us. And the man who was the head of the Icelandic Football Association at that time, he was wise enough, as I said before, to use the money to invest in the future, instead of building monuments on new football stations. He uh, built small football grounds almost in every village and town in Iceland. He trained young coaches and built indoor football halls. So now we have a team which of course became the celebration of the European Cup and is now one of the phenomena. And if they win this game today, they are in all likelihood going to go forward to the next round, which is somehow unbelievable. I mean, the combined market value of the Icelandic team when they played England, I mean, market value in terms of what they were paid for the foreign teams that they played with, was less than the market value of one player in the English team. And I often said to people abroad, for us in Iceland, football is not about money. It's about the sport and the social spirit. And I think the team is exactly that. It is a team. It's not an Argentina, which is basically Messi plus sort of ten others. And whatever happens in this game, the nation will continue to be proud and support them. And I will leave you with this scene, which is my memory from Paris. After we were defeated by France, we had gone far in the European Championship. 
So we were playing France in Paris in the presence of the president of France, François Hollande, who sat next to me, and I knew him quite well. And we lost, as probably many of you know football, no, we lost dramatically, it was 6-2 or 5-2. Uh, we actually won the second half, I mean, of the game. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow that didn't count in the end. So, so France defeated us, I mean, gloriously. But what happened? When the game was over, the French supporters left the statue because quickly. But the Icelandic supporters, who were there, thousands of them, kept on cheering the, their national team with this famous uh, clap. And, 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 and not just for one minute, not just for two minutes, but on and on and on. And President Hollande, who was supposed to leave early, he stood there mesmerized. But almost every other Frenchman had left the big station. He stood there mesmerized because as a leading politician, he understood that this was the national spirit, the national support, which supports the team even in the times of failure and losing the game. So for 15 minutes, the president of France stood there, watching, not the game, that was over, but the Icelandic supporters celebrating the loss against France in this way. And that also brings me back to the entrepreneurship and management and the economy. You have to be able to celebrate the loss as well as you celebrate the winners. Perfect. Thanks you very much, Mr. Thank you. And the truth may vary, this ship will carry our bodies safe to shore.